Thank you. 30 years ago as a cadet, I couldn't have imagined being invited back to the academy to share my thoughts on character and leadership. But when I saw the theme of this year's symposium, it truly resonated with me. I knew I had a story to tell, and it begins with my family. Thus the title, My Generations and the Core Values. And what I hope you get out of this talk this morning is uh, an understanding of how core values have existed for many, many years, long before there was an Air Force. And um, I want to show you through my family stories um, just how core values played a role in their dreams and um, in their accomplishments. This is a picture of me and my father, Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Brown, Jr. He was a leader. He was a man of honor. He was a man of character. So it is my honor and privilege to share my family's stories with you in hopes that we'll all be able to learn and be inspired to become better leaders of character. So this is, uh, I share a birthday with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is a picture of me and my wife Trish in DC at the MLK Memorial. His most famous speech was I Have a Dream, given right there in DC on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Fortunately or unfortunately, he now has a memorial of his own. As a child growing up through the Civil Rights Movement, I would say that Dr. King's dreams and my mother and father's dreams let my dreams become true opportunities and allow me to find my calling. So let's the, the stories begin. And to start the stories, I need to give you a little bit of background. My family, as far as I can trace back, were born and raised in Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana was significant uh, for the slave trade back in the day between the Mississippi River and the New Orleans port. Um, my, my grandmother, my great grandmother, was born just after the Civil War. It was 1865 when uh, the Civil War ended, the 13th Amendment was passed abolishing uh, slavery. So just those six years later, um, Amy Brazier uh, was born. And she was a pretty amazing woman when I listened to the stories that my mother told of her as a healer and a midwife. The thing that was interesting about this time is that there was complete segregation in the South. And yet my mom would tell stories of my grandmother and how, her grandmother, and how people would come from all walks of life to seek her care. Women with serious um, health issues would come to Amy Brazier. She was known throughout the state. And it didn't matter what race. And so, to me, that was one of the first things that epitomized excellence. Because without excellence, she wouldn't have had that reputation. She wouldn't have, uh, the word wouldn't have got out for the things that she was able to do um, for women. I was able to locate the 1920 census um, that listed Eugene and Amy Brazier, my great grandparents, and their children. And my grandmother, as she, call, as she uh, would tell me, there was 14 um, children. There were a couple of twins that died um, early in childbirth. But um, on that census, it states that Eugene and Amy could not read or write. But one of the things that was emphasized in their household was their children were going to get an education. And they, they saw to it that they got an education. So you know, you list um, uh, on this census and you had uh, children as young as five years old and could read. And, um, and so that was a, uh, another one of those core value issues that you could see in that, in, uh, my family where um, education was important and, and excellence was going to get you there. So my grandmother 
was born in 1905, um, and she was a teacher. That was her calling. That was her passion. And trust me, I can still remember as a little kid. I mean, I had books since before I could barely walk, and my grandmother would read to me and um, made uh, learning um, something that I wanted to do. Uh, but as you can see, even though the state of Lu the State Department of Education in Louisiana did issue a teaching certificate to my grandmother, it was restricted. She was only um, certified to teach in the Negro schools only. Thus, just setting that stage of what it was like back then with the, the, uh, the total segregation. Um, the, t the certificate was issued to her in 1928. This is a picture of her with her, uh, one of her classrooms. And um, my grandmother had great sacrifice. Um, in order to do her craft uh, and a t as a teacher, there were a lot of outlying schools in, the, in Louisiana where she would have to drive to get there early in the morning, light the coal stove um, to, to, to practice her craft, to follow her, her dreams in, in teaching. And again, um, to do this, it showed me her service before self, the fact that uh, she was dedicated to educating these young ki kids, and there was that element of excellence. This is the cover of her diploma from Southern University. And just to give you a little history of Southern University, it was one of the original black colleges. Initially, was opened in New Orleans. But as the college was expanding, they knew that they were gonna need more room. There were a couple of other colleges that were in, black colleges that were in New Orleans. And so Southern University in 1914 was moved to its current location, East Baton Rouge, Louisiana, an area called Scotlandville, where both my mom and my dad grew up. So here's a picture of my grandmother. And what you see there, competent and deserving, was the mantra for Southern University. They would, um, they had education open uh, for the blacks in the area, but you had to be competent and deserving. And education, or excellence in education, was going to be um, the bridge to bridge that gap of segregation. And the next picture shows her diploma. In 1938, she got her Bachelor of Arts in Education. And at this time, my mother was seven. So talk about that um, service before self. This was this had to be an incredibly difficult thing to do uh, back in that in that time where she was still working on her education. She had a young daughter. Um, her husband, my grandfather, was a, a chef. He he uh, uh, was a cook on the riverboats. And so the stability that my mother had um, in her life at that early age was with my great grandmother. Uh, she actually, they actually lived in that house during that time. And so my mom's um, education really flourished at that time. She, my grandmother would send her out to the field to pick certain plants that she would use um, for her healing. Uh, so there was that aspect of education. Her mother, uh, when she would come home, it was about the books and teaching her how to read and reading to her and really you know, just allowing her to blossom as, as, as a young girl. And uh, both my parents, as we'll, I'll talk about um, later, were only children. So um, my mom was, was really, she was the apple of her, her father's eye and, and um, they really surrounded her with so much love, but all in the realm of excellence and um, integrity. There was a very strong faith in that, ho in, in that household. And they all had to um, sacrifice in different ways uh, during those times. So this is a picture of my parents. My dad on the left as a very young boy in Scotlandville, Louisiana, and my mother. And um, they were, they grew up in really two different worlds 
right there in the same community, where my mom's family uh, was was educated, they were involved in different things. My, my, my mom's oldest sister, the oldest child, um, got her education out in DC. She was a nurse, she was involved in, 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 uh, in, in healthcare and, and uh, a, you know, again, a service um, uh, profession. My father, on the other hand, was born um, in 1929 uh, to a single mother. His mom was 19 at the time. Um, his dad was in the area and uh, was, a, was a minister, a, a reverend in, in uh, Louisiana. And while um, he acknowledged his son, he really wasn't uh, a part of, of his life um, to that degree. And my father was actually raised by his grandparents, uh, Peter Stewart and, and uh, uh, Julia Stewart. We called her Mama Sadie. Um, and, and Peter was a sharecropper. Neither one of my uh, great-grandparents on my father's side um, could read or write. And their, his upbringing was, was a lot different. But one of the things that they did for their young grandson was they made sure that he had an education. And growing up in Scotlandville was actually uh, a very um, fortunate thing for them because Southern University was there. And how did Southern University train their uh, upcoming teachers was through what they called the lab school. So from grade school to high school, they had a lab school that was attached to Southern University, and that's where my mother and father were educated. And that's how they got to know each other. Uh, my father, being an only child, had a cousin who was also an only child, Mabel Stewart, who was my mother's best friend. They had been friends since kindergarten and were friends all the way through college. And, um, and at that time, as young kids in, in grade school, you know, there was her big cousin, Lewis, that kind of looked, looked after the, the girls. They, they had um, you know, strong relationships going on as far as things that they would do as a group. They'd go to movies on the weekend or, or uh, things like that. And, my father really became um, smitten with my mother, for lack of a better term, over, over, those, over the years. And um, that's when his dreams started to form of the things that he wanted. He saw, he saw positive role models in my mom's side of the family with um, members who had joined the military, uh, the importance of, of education. And he knew that he was going to have to step it up if he was ever going to um, be able to win the love of Janice Brown. So um, he also tells a story of how um, his upbringing and some of the lessons that were imparted on him as a, as a young boy, he saw the sacrifices that his grandfather would make in order to focus on uh, his education. And dad would tell stories of how his grandfather would um, walk to work for a week at a time um, to save that bus fare so that my dad would have the money to participate in the, in the um, school field trip or another activity um, that would require extra money that they just didn't have. And also during that time, my dad will tell you that um, he got teased a lot because of, of his background. And we all know how cruel kids can be, but it would be things like making fun of him because his sandwich that he had for lunch was on, bis on a biscuit instead of bread. But he toughened through those times and uh, was always um, taught to have good manners and, um, and those things carried him, him through. Next slide. So this brings me to this slide uh, labeled First Impressions. And so one of the things that his grandmother, Mama Sadie, impressed on him was that you never get a second chance at a good first impression. And so uh, my father, as my mom said, was always a sharp dresser. When he was in his teens, as his grandparents were aging, he took on jobs. He, 
she shined shoes for one of the department stores and eventually uh, became one of the delivery boys for the, for the department stores. My mother would say, I don't know how much money he brought back to the house because he always had, he, he, he spent it all on clothes. But um, his, uh, his, this whole issue of um, uh, first impressions um, goes back to the time that he would spend um, and my grandparents, like Papa Johnny and, and uh, Olivia's um, store. They had a store and a cafe. And my, my grandfather was the head chef um, in the cafe, and my dad would hang out. You know, the kids always hang, would, would hang out at the store, but he would actually hang out talking to my grandparents and uh, telling them that how one day he was going to marry their daughter. And um, my mom, uh, I, I was actually able to come across some of her memoirs, some of the things that she wrote. And she said, you know, all this time knowing him for all those years, she didn't realize that she was actually falling in love with him. And so, um, uh, you know, my dad uh, having these, these, these dreams, his big question was, how am I ever going to be able to provide for a family and, um, and, and, and make a, a career be successful? And, and he did that, he saw the, the military as an opportunity. And so uh, one day when he was leaving the store where he was working, he noticed that there was a poster on the window. And it was a recruitment poster for, at that time, the Army Air Corps, because the Air Force didn't exist. And um, he said that for days and weeks on end, he kept thinking about that poster. And he was 16 at the time, going on 17, and still in high school, hadn't finished high school. But for him, that was his dream, and that's what he wanted to do. And so he went to his grandparents and asked their permission to allow him to join the military. And knowing that they had raised this young boy to become, who is now becoming a, a young man, and he, he, he did have integrity. Um, he was a hard worker. He, he strived for excellence. And they granted him that wish. And so this is a, a picture of my dad early in his um, career on the left. Uh, these were some of his role models, um, my mom's cousins that were in the military. And, um, and being the, the first impression guy and always wanted to be a sharp dresser, this really just fit in line with, with my dad, um, his uniforms, and, and uh, um, he had great pride um, in wearing that uniform. So next slide. Uh, so after that first year uh, of being in the service, he was home on leave in uh, December of 1948. And at that time, he asked my grandfather and my grandmother if he could have their daughter's hand in marriage. And they said yes. So my mom and my dad got married in, uh, in Baton Rouge uh, December 30th, 1948. And two days later, later he had to report back to um, his duty station. And my mom was a freshman at Southern University at that time, and she went back to school. And so um, this, I thought, depicted you know, the fact that they had this bond, this trust with each other. Uh, as well as the, the service before self, where my dad had a job to do, and he understood that my mom had her obligations uh, for her education. And they, they went back to fulfill their duties at that time, knowing that they could trust their situation as far as um, the love that they had for each other. So the courtship continued, even, and, and now they were a married couple. Um, separated uh, based on um, their, their current commitments. So then my father um, did very well. I mean, the, the military was, um, I always said, was one of the best things that ever happened to him. He joined in, in uh, August of 47. Um, 18 September 1947 is when the Air Force became the Air Force. 
my freshman cadet knowledge coming back to me. Um, and so there was something that was going on at that, at that point in time. Um, the end of World War II, uh, where at the time, uh, during World War II, the units were completely segre segregated. You know, we know all about the Tuskegee Airmen. But there was prejudice still um, amongst the senior leaders towards the black airmen and the black soldiers. Um, the, the, the leadership said that the blacks had a lack of integrity, they were inferior airmen and inferior soldiers, they were cowardly, um, they were denigrated as traitors, and even called communists. I mean, it was, it was pretty brutal at that, um, at that time. But it was recognized that the efficiencies of the military and the best use of the manpower was going to happen with integrating um, the units. Finally, it became an order. President Truman ordered um, the integration, and it was going to happen. So the Air Force actually led the way um, in the integration of the services. They had um, the qualifications, or that their their their. Um, uh, standards were that the patients, uh, the, the soldiers had to be skilled and qualified. And um, Benjamin O. Davis, who was one of the, or it was Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, who was one of the original commanders for Tuskegee Airmen, and also a graduate of West Point, um, one of the first black um, graduates of West Point, who was a cadet in silence his whole four years. I mean, the, the, his classmates, his white classmates, would not speak to him. He did, nobody spoke to him for four years. So he actually stepped in and added the standard um, for this integration, and that the uh, airmen had to have, be of good temperament, um, have good judgment, have the common sense to get along smoothly, and lastly, possess the ability to warrant the respect of the, the unit as a whole. Well, these standards truly epitomize Lewis Brown Jr. My dad um, was selected as part of that 10% of the blacks that were going to integrate. And um, he'll tell the story of how it was difficult uh, because he got it from both sides. Um, at that time, like I said, there was only 10% that were, that were going to be part of the integrated unit. They really didn't want any more than 10% of blacks um, in that unit. And um, the other black uh, airmen were allowed to stay in segregated units if they wanted. So he got it from the blacks that, that remained in the segregated units because he was a traitor. And he got it from the whites who said he didn't belong. But my, my father, could actually see the greater good of all of this. And this was you know, a big sacrifice. And through his own integrity, his service before self, and excellence, he took this on as a challenge. This is a picture of him in, in uh, Korea, 1954. And my dad was, um, he had made tech sergeant by the age of 23. Um, he did very well. Um, and a lot of his childhood lessons, I think, translated to his success in the Air Force. Number one, that, that integrity, always being a, a man that could be trusted. Um, his, uh, his service bef before self. I mean, talk about um, service before self when you're dealing with this newly integrated units and the isolation that he felt um, and, and, and the fear that he felt and, and sometimes envy because of the, the other airmen that stayed within their, their comfort zone of, of the, the segregated unit. But he knew that this, was, that this was the right move and this was going to bring um, excellence um, to the service that he was growing to love. Um, the title of this slide is Standing Proud. Um, I can say that uh, one of the, the things that my mother um, had done for us kids after my dad passed away was she commissioned a bronze um, with one of the local artists in Loveland, Colorado. And Teresa Hansen did an awesome job of, of uh, 
making a bronze that my mom gave a copy to my sister and my brother and I. And, um, and that's what she named it, Standing Proud. Because, you know, that's what she said about my dad. You know, after every enlistment, he would always ask my mother, or, or before every um, re-enlistment, he would ask my mother, do you want to go back to Louisiana? Do you want to go back to your family? And, you know, to, and to your parents. And, 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 and she would ask him, do you love what you do? And he would always say yes. And she said, you are my family. This is my family. And, and one of the greatest things that helped my father throughout his career, and he, and he would say this, was the support that he had from his wife. And you know, she had her, her sacrifices, but that was for the good of everybody. And um, so my father's success, I, get, I go back to that, those first impressions. Um, his demeanor and his focus on always doing the best that you can. Next slide. So he, um, he served with excellence. He became one of the first um, black chief master sergeants in the Air Force after uh, 15 years of service. But at 23 years, he retired. And um, that was kind of a, a, a difficult time for him. Um, I had a brother who was a preppy here at the Air Force Academy. And my dad was doing everything in his power to get stationed at, in Colorado. And um, a lot of that hinged on the fact that George, my oldest brother, was, um, had to move between his junior and senior year in high school. Um, dad was stationed at Elmendorf up in Alaska. Um, and he got orders to Scott Air Force Base and between George's um, junior and senior year. And my dad didn't want to do that to my brother, my other brother, who was the next in line, um, who was coming towards the end of, of junior high. So uh, my dad retired from the Air Force after third, um, 23 years, and we moved to Fort Collins, Colorado, where he um, taught junior ROTC at Poudre High School. So this, is the continuance of the long blue line. My father had um, very much, uh, so much pride in the Air Force and um, was very proud of, of George, who um, later on became a member of the class of 1974. Um, this is where my dreams really started. Um, when George was at the prep school, I, we must have visited Colorado from Illinois at least four or five times in that, in that uh, nine month period. But it was then as an eight or nine year old uh, girl that um, I said, when I get big, I'm going to the Air Force Academy because girls will be able to go by then. And so um, uh, that was my dream. Tragically, um, on December 20th, 1970, um, George was killed in a car accident on I-70. He had just been released from, um, uh, for Christmas break. Mom and Dad came down here to Colorado Springs to pick him up, uh, went up to Fort Collins, and then on that Saturday, some family friends, their daughter had invited him to a dance down in, in, um, in Denver. And on his way home that night, um, they figure he fell asleep at the, at the wheel. Um, car left the highway, he hit a brake and, bu and, and, and died instantly. So this was uh, a, a very tragic um, situation for uh, my family. And, um, but uh, um, I, I, I still held that dream, but as I got through my high school years, I was a little rebellious. I started by that application to the Air Force Academy and I got halfway through it and I, and I just said, I don't think this is for me. My dad had tried to convince me to join junior ROTC and I'm like, no way, dad, I'm not wearing that uniform in the middle of the class all, you know, all day. And um, you know, with, with um, the rest of my friends around me. And, um, and, I, and I put that dream aside. Uh, I, I, I went back to my great grandmother's roots of 
being a healer and in medicine and my aunt Sissy who was a nurse and and um, and I I after graduation from high school I went to Colorado State University and um, was a microbiology major and I was going to go into medicine well I I enjoyed the college life <laughs> I um, I played basketball all I actually I sent the set I, I sat on the bench at CSU. And um, I joined a sorority, um, and I just partied and had a good time. And then I realized that uh, if I don't get a little more discipline in my life, I may not graduate from college. But also what was happening at that time was that one of my, my family's good friends, the McCaffreys, my dad had helped their son Pete with his application and getting into the, into the service academy. And um, you know, Pete wanted to fly. His father was uh, one of the original um, uh, in the, the early um, cadet, flying cadet squadrons uh, back east. And he ended up having, he ended up getting disqualified for something. So, so Big Mac, as we called him, because he was a tall guy, Never got to fly, but he really inspired that with his, with his son. And so, you know, Pete had always been two years ahead of me at, at, at uh, in junior high and high school, and close family friends. And when he got into the academy, that really just kind of sparked that interest in me again. And so, um, freshman year at, at CSU, I reapplied to the academy, and um, I got an appointment to the prep school, which at first I was really upset about, and then, and I also got an appointment um, to West Point, because I, you know, the focus there was that in, in the Army, the, the medical corps was much bigger, and they, they had more um, cadets that they would send to, to medical school. And so I went out to New York, and I thought that was great, I was gonna be, you know, I, I was far away from home, and you know, not that far from New York City, this is for me. And then I realized, you know, Gina, you really don't like the color green that much. And oh, by the way, when you graduate, you will be in the Army. And I just couldn't see that. So, um, and then I went back to my brother. It's like, you know, my brother did the prep school. He got into the academy. I'm gonna follow, um, I'm gonna follow his lead. It's, this, is, this has been my dream. And oh, by the way, if I don't like it, I don't have to stay. So, I finally was able to complete my dream, but also the dreams of my father and my brother. And um, it was a struggle. There's, there's no doubt about it. But I can honestly say that uh, there's a pride and uh, a feeling that I get even today when I come back here um, that I never thought I would uh, when I was a cadet leaving. But you realize in life, and, and, and you know, we'll go on about this, is that you, know, you have your dreams and you always have to follow your dreams. And this was just but the first of my dreams. Next slide. So um, I enter the Air Force as a second lieutenant. I go to pilot training at Vance Air Force Base. I, the whole issues of, of medicine at this point have completely left me. I'm at the Air Force Academy. You fly, fight, and win at the Air Force Academy. So I was really, you know, it was all about, about, all about flying. And, um, and so I made it to pilot training, and I made it out of pilot training without wings. Um, I washed out in T-37s, never got to fly the T-38. And at first, it was very devastating for me. Actually, it was more embarrassing for me. It was like I didn't know how to, to tell people that I went to pilot training and I didn't make it. And, um, and that was really um, some humble pie at that point. And so you, know, you really had to dig within yourself and move on. And so I became a management engineering officer, manpower officer, um, doing industrial engineering work in the Air Force, time and motion studies, learning a lot about the Air Force and different organizations. But what rekindled my, um, my, my desire and my dreams of medicine was actually doing one of those manpower studies on the lab in radiology at March Air Force Base. And 
I would go collect data different times of the day and night, and it was really walking into the hospital at midnight and, and, um, and what was going on that just would flood me with emotions. And um, I was a, a second, I was a first lieutenant at the time, um, starting to think about my, my education, what was I gonna do for my master's degree, because I needed to start you know, thinking along those lines, because promotions and you know, all that goes along with that. And I'm at March, living in Riverside, and there's Cal Poly Pomona right down the street. And um, I was a civil engineering major at the academy. That's a whole other story. And um, I was doing industrial engineering work uh, for the Air Force. Cal Poly had both programs, master's uh, program in both. So I researched all of that and ultimately decided I was going to do the IE program. That's what I was doing in the Air Force. That's what made the most sense. So I'm registered to start that semester, the next semester in, um, in September. And in June, July, I get orders to Scott. I'm going to Scott Air Force Base, um, Manpower, I'm going to headquarters, um, uh, Mac, and, and um, Mac at the time, later AMC. And at the same time, we were going through base closures. There was also, I would come across these articles like shortage of physicians in the Air Force. My mother in Colorado sends me an article, you know, from Colorado out to California about something about doctors and physicians and, you know, the military. So then I get out to Scott and I start thinking about what is it going to take for me to, um, to do this? And I started pursuing it. And, um, became my own pre-med advisor, essentially. Uh, being a civil engineering major, there were things like organic chemistry that I had never taken, and I needed that in the lab, and looked at all the requirements that I would need, and so I did that um, as a captain in the Air Force. Took the MCAT, and um, didn't have the best scores, which was kind of a, a pattern for me, because really, the Air Force wanted better scores um, for me to get right in, which is one of the reasons why I ended up the, at the prep school. And, um, and it just at that time, there was an article that came out in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about, um, uh, by Dr. Lee, who was one of the minority deans at Washington University in St. Louis. And, and it was about um, physicians, black physicians, they had this, the, um, what are the things that they were gonna do uh, because there was not equal representation of, of black physicians in, in, uh, in medicine. And so when I read that article, I wrote Dr. Lee a letter. And um, I met my desk like a week or so later uh, at, at, uh, at AMC, at headquarters AMC, and I've, I've got a phone call, and the secretary says it's Dr. Lee from WashU. And, um, and so I take the phone call, and he says, can you come down and meet with me? And, um, and I said, I would love to. And you know, I told him my whole story. And so we, he, we went through all of my records, and he basically told me, he said, you know, um, Captain Brown, um, everything is impressive, but your MCAT score is not good enough to get into WashU. And, um, but he told me that he has, a, he has a friend of his, Dr. Manny Comas, at St. Louis University, who, that has a pre, uh, what they called a med prep program. And I was like, oh, you know, I know all about prep schools. I can. And literally, while I was there, he made the phone call to Dr. Comas and you know, told him about me sitting right there in front of him. And that's when I got, you know, I remembered what my father said about you never get a second opportunity to make a good first impression. Well, obviously, I made a good first impression because Dr. Lee was the key to me having success and getting into medical school. So I applied to medical school at St. Louis University. I got into the, medical, into the med prep program. And um, from there, um, I, uh, I started medical school. So, next. So, um, 
I got off active duty, I joined the reserves, I became a medical service corps officer, because it was still important for me to serve. Um, I, um, I was in the reserves while I was going through med school. I was able to follow my calling, and I was able to continue my commitment um, to the military. Next slide. And then, eventually, I graduated from medical school. So, um, this was graduation day. Um, I felt like at that point in time I had it all. I was able to be, uh, to follow my family's um, uh, history as a, as a healer, the service before self and still being part of the military and being in, in medicine, which is also a, talk about a service before self um, uh, profession. And it really helped me with that, something that was very important to me and that connection with people. And you know, this was this was something that I learned, um, you know, from my parents and my family, um, that that went way back. But there was that that um, commitment through adversity. And what I mean by this, and I'll kind of go through this, is that med school was not easy. It was there. It was a struggle on so many levels. Um, what I mean by the struggles. Uh, with family was during medical school is when my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And during his battle with prostate cancer, he was also diagnosed with kidney cancer. Um, so there was dealing with that. Um, and then there was the age barrier as well. I mean, I was in a completely different situation than most of my classmates in medical school because all they were doing was focusing on medical school. I still had my reserve commitments as a, as a reservist, you know, my one week in a month, and um, you know, some of the things that went along with that. But then there was also a bit of a, uh, a learning edge, being out of the classroom and being in such an intense environment um, at that time. I had my struggles, and particularly back again with the testing. Well, for those of you who know, medicine is all about testing. I mean, you have, the three um, steps that you have to take um, throughout medical school. And then you have your board certification for you know, your, your specialty and your board certification uh, for your subspecialty. And trust me, I had enough failures going through that, that time frame that most people would have just said, this isn't for me. But I knew in my heart of hearts that this was my calling. And so I went back to my to my roots, to the things that I had learned, not only from my family, but especially from here at the Air Force Academy, is that you never quit. And you always strive for excellence. And so eventually, I overcame those, those, uh, um, those testing is issues and got my board certification and became um, a, uh, a board certified internist and medical oncologist. But it was bittersweet. This is a picture of me and my dad, Louis Brown Jr., in front of Lombardi Cancer Center in, in Georgetown, at Georgetown in Washington, DC. Um, that's where I did my internal medicine residency. And um, towards the end of that, my dad um, was dealing with the end of his life. And, um, but he was still hoping for more treatments, but those treatments were really starting to, to break him down and take away his quality of life. And so one of the hardest things I had to do was consult with one of my attending physicians, Dr. Gelman. He was a um, genitourinary oncologist. He focused on prostate cancer and bladder cancer and, and kidney cancer. And I told him what was going on with my dad. I, you know, I had all the data because I kept track of everything. and so. Ed agreed to, to, to see my dad. And this was probably one of the hardest um, uh, appointments that I had ever had to witness. Um, you know, my mom and dad flew out from Colorado to DC, um, and we all um, went to that appointment. And Ed had looked over all of his records, he had his images, and he basically told my father that um, 
you know, that there really wasn't anything um, that we were going to be able to do that was going to give him um, uh, any quality of life or, or make this cancer better. And so um, um, I really appreci appreciated uh, his integrity and his honesty at that point. And um, it just really went back to uh, the importance of, of integrity. Because my father needed to hear that, and even though it was, it was uh, uh, difficult. Um, but I also put up this slide um, to tell you that you never should give up on your dreams. Because if I had given up when I was struggling with step one or step two, or when I was struggling with my internal medicine boards, I would have never um, made it to this point. And this is a picture of me and my mother. Um, the other part of that story was that three months after my dad passed away, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, a rare, a rare uterine sarcoma. And um, she, it, this was just as I had, been ex, uh, had accepted my um, fellowship to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And um, my mom did not want to go through what she saw my dad go through. So her approach to her diagnosis was completely different. She was like, I'm not going to do the chemo. I'm not going to do any of the, uh, the things that, that um, were recommended at that time. She was going to do things her way. The nice thing for me about that, though, was my, my program director, Ross Donauer, who was an awesome, awesome man. Um, I've actually got a couple of stories that I want to tell you about him. But when I wrote to him and told him that my mother was diagnosed with cancer, literally within 30 minutes, I had emails. He had contacted Deb Armstrong, who was the head of the, the GYN um, uh, cancers at Hopkins. and um, and all of these, these things happened um, in a flurry. And my mom had her care at Hopkins, so I got to see her every quarter when she'd come out. Usually a friend, you know, her friends fought over who was going to fly out to Baltimore with her um, to attend because we always had a good time when we were, when we were there, despite what, we were there, what she was there for. Um, but my mother's approach was, always about being happy. And thus, the quote here with JFK, the ancient Greek definition of happiness was the full use of your powers along the lines of excellence. And my message to you in this is the full use of your calling along the lines of excellence. It's you've got to follow your calling. Um, that the, back to the, the, the issue of, the, of first impressions, um, you know, I told you the story about Dr. Lee and how that led to my medical school. Well, the, uh, the fellowship in Hopkins was a similar story. Ross Donauer was our, our, um, our program director. And he told me, he he told me this later after I'd finished um, my fellowship and I was on my way back to Fort Collins. But he said, one of the very first things that impressed me about you when you came to interview at Hopkins was the way you approached my secretary when you came for your interview. And my secretary reported that to me. And I knew that you were what we were looking for in our program. And so it goes back to that, that, that slide and that story about my dad and first impressions, and that you never have a second chance to make a first impression. So I want to, I want to leave you with that. Um, uh, that's very important. But the other thing, as a leader, and you're going to be leading airmen that are older than you, airmen that have more experience than you, but you always want to treat them with respect and with, re and with kindness, and they will follow you. So my stories, I hopefully ex expressed the commitment to excellence. My dreams and callings were born of generations and anchored through the core values of integrity, service before self, and excellence. I want you to remember this. You always owe yourself excellence. 
the rest will follow. Thank you. stories about coming back from World War II and, and how difficult it was. He had, um, he had um, African American comrades who fought in the war, married uh, German, uh, German brides, came back to Texas. Um, they were no longer allowed to walk on the streets with their brides. Um, and uh, he told the story several times. That he, he told his good friend, uh, I said, you need to go back to Germany. She says, it's going to work in America. I would say, I want to be funky for other people's freedoms. And so I, when I saw um, the, the, the picture of your father in, in, in Korea, it just made me, I, I wonder, did, did he ever talk about what it was, what was the social life like? What was it like? What was it like? Was it, what, what was, was being in the military uh, a cocoon? Was he away from all of those kinds of things or the segregation and all those things that were going on in America then or not? So that, that's a great question. So <laughs> asking the question about, you know, even going back to the picture of my dad in Korea, what was it like for him um, from a social standpoint or how did he deal um, with those surroundings? And it's very interesting because, you know, both of my parents are gone now. And as I was preparing to come here for NCLS, I was able to, you know, scrounge up pictures and and uh, and letters, and I found a box of letters that my father wrote to my mother while he was in Korea. And I mean, and we're talking a lot of letters. He was there for ten months, and um, but there were there were times. It was really funny because for the most part, he never. What I've got from looking through those letters was that he never wanted to burden my mother with what was happening to him over there. But every once in a while, there would be a letter where he would talk about, you know, he was supposed to be the NCOIC of um, whatever the operation was on that was going on over there. And somebody had come in and had taken that away from him. And he was, he was so, you know, it, it bothered him. Um, so much, but that goes back to, you know, one of when I when I made the comment about the isolation, and um, and some of that anger that he had to hold inside because he could not he could not display that he could not um, uh, express that, and um, and so those were uh, were things that I could kind of read between the lines because he did he really did not talk about that much. It was not until. The last months, I, uh, my last, um, the, the last few months of my father's life, I actually took a leave from my residency, um, supported very strongly by my um, program, to come back to Colorado and, and spend the last couple of months with my dad before he died. And I would ask him you know, some of those questions. And it really wasn't until then that he expanded on what it was like to be in the integrated unit and, and how hard that was. Oh, so that's good. Um, Trish was reminding me. So, we, so I was born in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then um, my dad was stationed at Hickam. And as a toddler, we moved back. We, his, he, we moved to, to, um, to Scott Air Force Base. So you're talking about the 60s. And when we arrived at Scott Air Force Base, they didn't have billeting on base for, for my dad and his family. Well, Belleville, Illinois, and, and uh, O'Fallon, Illinois, I don't know if you're familiar with that area, we could not get a hotel room in that area. We had to drive to East St. Louis to get a hotel for that night until 
the base housing was, was available. And my mother, you know, tells a story of how she didn't sleep the entire night. She sat at the window watching her car that was, you know, loaded down from the end and didn't sleep. Um, so there was, there was still that, that, that was going on, it's, but, but like you said, being on base and going to base schools, um, you know, obviously I ended up, we ended up moving to Colorado when I was, uh, and I ended up finishing grade school, junior high and high school here, so, um, you know, you're right, I didn't, I didn't experience those things on the outside, but what I did experience is when we would go back to Louisiana to visit my grandparents, whether it was Christmas break or summer break, when, you know, I really understood how backwards the South was. You know, I, my, my cousins, I can remember this to this day. My Mabel, my mom's best friend, um, her daughter went to a private school, private Catholic school in Baton Rouge. And it was basketball season, so her team was playing basketball. We were junior high. And, um, and so, yeah, we're gonna go to her, her, uh, her team's basketball game. And we went into the gym, and you had her school, black sat in one section, white sat in another section, cheering for the same team. And that just blew me away. I, did, I, you know, I just couldn't understand that. So um, there are a lot of those, those um, you know, during my dad's time, that, that, that thought process that, that um, that prevailed. I mean, he'll tell you that, you know, he made tech sergeant at at age 23, and um, he hit a brick wall uh, between senior and chief when he was in Hawaii. He said, "I should have been a chief before you were born," but he ran into some of that senior leadership that blocked and blocked and blocked him, and um, and then you know finally. So, so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't uh, like the military was. Totally. Right. Oh no. I mean, he had his, he had his his struggles. But I think that the thing is, is that my dad also had, you know, such struggles that when he was a kid, that, um, you know, this was just part of part of the deal. And what he wanted to make sure with his kids is that we didn't ever have to go through the things that he did. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm a visiting cadet from Oklahoma University, uh, but I'm from St. Louis, and so I know exactly the areas that you're talking about, and I know the prestige associated with St. Louis University. Um, and so I was just wondering, um, I'm also a nursing major, so uh, the prestige associated with the Air Force, as well as going to St. Louis University, and um, just providing that holistic care and having the core values lined up Uh, what would you say would be like the one thing you either learned in the military that applied to medical or vice versa that was the most influential in your careers? I think that probably the biggest thing is is that aspect of teamwork. Uh, you realize that me as a physician, I'm not going to be able to um, provide the excellent care for a patient without the other parts of that team, the nurses that are involved, the medical assistants, the, the uh, um, I mean, just all of the parts that, that go into the care of, of a patient. Well, um, in order for that to, to, to work, I have to be a good leader as a physician to those people that I'm, that I'm counting on to do their, their job. And so I think that my uh, graduating from the leadership laboratory of the Air Force Academy, I feel that that was a, was a great um, transition. Uh, the other part that we learn here um, and that you are learning in, in, in ROTC is, the, is how you have to count on your teammates. So that, um, that uh, teamwork piece uh, is very important. Does that help? Does that answer yes, your question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. 
Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, through all the adversities, do you ever appoint like just one day that just like maybe this is too much, like going through? Oh. And yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot of times. I mean, Trish, so this is my wife, Trish, and we've been together for 22 years, going on 23 years. It'll be 23 years in, the, in, in November. And um, I'm sure that she could probably answer that question better. I mean, there were, you know, it was like, even at the academy, you know, you had, there were definitely days you had your tears. Well, I had plenty of tears, um, you know, through, through medical school as well, um, those board exams. and. You know, um, but I think it was really those core values. I mean, the 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 things that you that you learned here at the academy, going through basic training and going through Siri. I mean, I, I I look back on those things, and it's like at the end of the day, I can do anything. And I think that that was one thing that somebody had told me once is that you can be anything you want to be, and so. That's what I would fall back on after I stopped crying. <laughs> well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for your inspirational message. I think in terms of the cadets here, I feel like you really speak to how vocation and life with you and your letter change away from a lifetime of vacation. <laughs> really appreciate your message and thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Black. Black. Black.